We're just waiting for the massive crowds to keep coming in and getting their seats. Hey, the, the elevator I rode up, everybody was coming to this panel. And you were the only one in the elevator, so. No, no, <laughs> there were uh, five of us. Well, we're, we're missing Scott Shaw, but, um, you know, it's after two, so I think we should just go ahead. And when Scott gets here, he can join us. Now, a lot of times at conventions, San Diego Cons Con, there have been panels about how San Diego Comic Con started, but I don't think there's ever been one about what was it like to be a fan in San Diego before Comic Con. So. And even before Star. Oh yeah. Okay. So we're talking about the, I guess, from '66 on period. Um, and I wanted to start with Dennis Smith because Dennis and I actually both went to Chula Vista High School. He was a uh, class of 63. I was class of 64. We were both in the band together. And uh, a few years later, we it ended up that you know, he, he was a science fiction illustrator. He, Harlan Ellison wrote stories based on Dennis's artwork. He was always an illustrator. We knew him from the science fiction fandom, but it turned out this guy was a comics fan too. So tell us a little bit about what it was like, how you got, how did you get your comics and find out about comics when you were, you know, in, in 67, 68, trying to, to be a comics fan? Well, I'll, I'll start by going a little bit further back uh, because there is a connection. Uh, uh, I moved to San Diego with my family in 1960 and started out at Chula Vista High School. And uh, in the first couple of years, it's the usual chaos and stuff. But then I ran across a couple, some other guys that read science fiction and got involved in science fiction clubs. In 62, I went to the Western Con in LA. So I was actively involved in a kind of fandom. And I think it was about the same year that comic fandom I heard about. It wasn't, uh, I hadn't really gotten into comics, but. And 64, 65, Worldcon in Oakland. Uh, so a heavy science fiction involvement. Uh, in 65, um, I ran into a guy named Tom Rainey. He published a magazine called Trumpet. I did some work for him. And it turns out that um, I did the work for him uh, later, but uh, he was a, a Dallas fan, because I'd come from Dallas when we moved out from Texas. And, uh, uh, and it turns out he was really interested in EC comics, so he got me kind of to thinking about comics when I was down visiting with him in, in uh, um, Plano, Texas, is where he lived. And uh, along about '66, we the, we had a club called the South San Diego Science Fiction Society. We were the we were the lowbrow crowd. Uh, they were. Some who regard this as not worthy of science fiction because we partied a lot and stuff like that. <laughs> but uh, we uh, got a Western Con here. It wasn't the greatest uh, fair, but it was kind of a unique place. That we had uh, the first representation of Star Trek. First time Harlan Ellison was a guest of honor at the convention was just at Western Con. And uh, it had some interesting people there. Theodore Sturgeon, who was prominent at the time in science fiction and fantasy, among others. And uh, so that was in 1966. So rolling into 66, I went through changes. I finally got out of uh, Southwestern College and went to San Diego State and started meeting people from other places. Along about 1967, I ran across a, some friends who invited me up to LA. And as I was up there, uh, I read a Doctor Strange from some comic company called Marvel. And uh, I really liked it a lot. And so I started getting really interested in comics, kind of backdated, and got involved in a lot of other Marvel comics. And along about the same time, I encountered underground comics, which were in a very different medium, very interesting to me as well. Um, as an artist, I'm pretty curious about how things go. So I actually did some traveling, went up to the print mint in San Francisco, or actually it's across the bay, and it was just uh, south of uh, uh, was it uh, oh, no, it, 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 no, it was west of Oakland, uh, south of uh, uh, the People's Republic of uh, Berkeley. Berkeley, right? <laughs> uh, 
It was a very interesting experience because when I went there, I was I, I was actually buying underground comics wholesale. I'd get them for eight cents a piece if you bought a couple of thousand at a shot. Uh, a lot of people from San Diego were working up there, by the way. And it's really this is 67, 68, and uh, uh, of course I'm still involved in science fiction and, and that sort of thing. But I'm gaining more and more interest in this kind of this, particularly the underground press. Um, and uh, uh, it, it was uh, it was a paranoid time because there were comics coming out that just possessing could get you thrown in jail at the time. My store got arrested for selling. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it was on a spinner that said, you know, hey kids, comics. I repeat, it said, hey kids, these comics aren't for you. Yeah. Well, in, uh, on Telegraph in uh, Berkeley, uh, there was a printment store where you could buy the posters, the, a lot of the Fillmore stuff. And, but if you ask about comics, uh, they would kind of look at you and okay, and then they. they advise you talk to somebody and then that person would say, well, you talk to somebody and you go through this long process of validation. I'll tell you, they had a reason though. When I actually got to the print mint, uh, they had a whole huge warehouse. They said, real simple, if, uh, if, a, if an undercover cop got into that warehouse and made a deal, uh, they would take everything. I mean, they could have been wiped off the map if they weren't that suspicious because this was happening at the time. If you, if you uh, look at the Berkeley Bar, you can see the arrests being made. And it was commonplace. People would sell the undergrounds by taking them out in a, in a uh, um, blanket. And they'd unroll the blanket on the, on the street. And, uh, and they'd always have it so you could snag it back. And literally, uh, if a car showed up, they'd roll it real quick and kind of fade into the corners. As, Sure, go ahead. My dad was the security officer at the San Diego Zoo, the head of security. And they had a group of this under... This is Scott Shaw. Oh, hi. I'm the, I'm the guy butting in here. Um, <laughs> it's just because the story is, is, is so great. I'd go out and buy underground comics from them, and they got to know these guys, and they did exactly what you had. They were ready to go at any time. So I, told, I gave them my father's schedule. So they, they would fold up before he ever got out there. He'd go back inside, they'd set up again. And they gave me, the, the, the deal was they gave me comics free if I, would, if, I, if I made sure they didn't get busted. Oh yeah, there's a lot of stuff. I remember they had a big meeting. Uh, it was held in a little house out in the middle of the field uh, overlooking uh, a mission, uh, uh, I guess, uh, Mission Valley. Um, and uh, it was like a huge meeting and you know, some of them were dope dealers, but it was like comic books. And it was tons of just original art and everything else. I mean, there's a lot of crazy stuff happened in the time. And I was caught up in it because I grabbed a bunch and I'd bring, I remember selling a, a bunch of uncut, uh, uh, I think, gory stories to uh, uh, Ken, Ken Kruger, who had a store out in Ocean Beach. Because uh, I'd come down, I'd pick them up, and you know, I'd pick them up literally at a lot of a thousand or so, because it's dirt cheap if you bought them like that. And, uh, and I just weren't, certainly weren't seeing any of that. Huh? Uh, Bruce, you, did, did, you didn't see those? Oh, good heaven. The money. Oh. I had a story on that. Oh, okay. <laughs> he kept yeah. printing it and printing it. That was, yeah. <laughs> but it was really, uh, it, was, it was a crazy, kind of crazy time in a way because uh, there was a lot of interesting stuff because some of it was just well-told stories. Some of it was just really exciting, experimental, graphic stuff. Um, you know, some of us become uh, culturally iconic, you know, I mean, Robert Crumb's, uh, you know, Keep on Trucking or Mr. Natural. Uh, but a lot of it to this day is just extremely obscure or it's somewhere in the middle ground. Um, and, you know, and it, you know, it, it kind of ran its course, but that got me open-minded to comics and having encountered Doctor Strange, which blew me away as a fantasy, just the sheer idea of the alternate universes and being able to pull around, got me into it. and. Uh, once I was into it, I just started picking them up, and I ended up at one point with a pretty good, complete run of Marvel, and lasted for 20 years until my interest went off in a different direction. I did, I sold most of them. I kept three or four thousand that I kind of was fond of, and that was pretty much it. Well, the, the thing I remember about Dennis is he's the first guy that Davy Estrada and I ever knew who bought two copies of everything. <laughs> he had a file copy and a reading copy. So, 
that to me that's a collector. But you know, going back to um, I'm Jackie Estrada, by the way, and uh, so in the '60s uh, I graduated from high school in '64, and my boyfriend was Davy Estrada, and we both got into comics at the same time we were in college, and it was mostly the Marvel era that sucked us in, that we were reading all of the, the Ditko and Kirby and, and everything comics. And we would, uh, every six months, go up to LA and go to Hollywood Boulevard and hit Cherokee Bookstore and Bargain Bookstore and uh, Larry Edmonds Movie Bookstore. Um, Bonds, Bonds Creek Books. There, there were there were just so many places there that you could go and, and get comics and then but living in Chula Vista the we would you know there were comic stores we would just go to the newsstand Blind Bob's newsstand on Third Avenue every week and buy every comic book and it would be Marvel and DC and Charlton and Gold Key and uh, Richie Rich you know, all. Whatever came out, we, we bought and we watched it. So I, I will bring up John Hall in a moment. <laughs> but that was, uh, as fans, that's how we obtained our comics until we discovered fanzines and mail order. So that that is a different topic. But I wanted to get to um, Scott and Dave, because they went to high school together. Hi, uh, I, I, would, I kind of think the moment I became a collector was when I was a little boy and I realized I had so many comics I needed to put them in the piles of which issues I had and which issues I was missing. And it, it all went bad from there. Um, I was a comic collector in that sense when I was about three years old. My parents insisted on bringing me, or, well, my, they, I insisted that they bring me comics. Um, when I wound up going into the uh, the hospital to get my tonsils out, I was the only kid. I was there with all these strange kids. Or ice cream, well, that's okay. But they have comic books. And it was like, comics are my friend. And I know an awful lot of people my age, that was kind of, that are, that are like us now, that kind of that's where they really found themselves relying on it as a getaway because you're a kid stranded in this hospital. I remember my dad bringing me a stack of comics that looked like it was like, you know, 20 feet high and it was probably about this many, but it was the most I'd ever gotten once. Anyway, that, that affection for comics kept going. And um, fortunately, by the time I got in junior high and high school, uh, I don't know about Horace Mann being huge, but Crawford was definitely like, I know we had over a thousand people just in our graduating class. Yeah, 3,700 students in the Crawford was the biggest party. high school, and they broke it in half, and then those were the two biggest high schools in San Diego. So there were enough of us weirdos there. Um, we all kind of knew each other, and um, we decided in, I believe, in 1967, that was my senior year, we created what we called the Underground Film Society. And it really was just a fan club. We didn't try to make a movie. We actually shot footage. We went down to the San Diego Zoo and went on. My dad, being the chief security, got us on the service trails. We were trying to shoot an adaptation of Sound of Thunder. With Greg Bear, Scott Shaw, uh, Roger Friedman, John Pound, and myself, uh, who all went on to be involved in the founding of Comic Con and were all great friends. Um, I want to say that lunchtime at Crawford High School was a bit like a mini con going on because they were staggered. There were three different lunch periods, but you'd run into people and you'd sit in the quad or go into the newspaper office, which was adjacent there, and talk science fiction and fantasy movies and comics. And I was on the newspapers. So well, every day, every day, with enough and enough people to get a critical mass of enthusiasm um, that that really made it great. And you know, I've heard from fans of people all over the country talk about being lonely in some town and not having any friends that like the same stuff they liked, that we never had that experience. We had, you know, we, 
had a, and, a and fan really, scene going on right in our school. Not, not that I want to sound like I'm so full of myself, but I'm just very proud that so many of us kind of got to achieve our dream. Mm -hmm. And I think that our friendship back then was really integral to that. We had a support group. We, we never got beaten up because there were probably, you know, our core group of, you know, maybe a dozen people. And a lot of us wanted to be either cartoonists or writers or illustrators. And so we had our own game. It was, it was a <laughs> game. Uh, the fans. What were your colors? Uh, <laughs> black and blue. Black and, black and blue. blue. Corduroy. <laughs> I was black and blue. How about, how about red, yellow, and blue? Yeah. yeah. I was black and blue because I kept getting beaten up in gym for saying it's only a game. <laughs> you know, I want to. I want to. Uh, I want to. To touch on something Dennis said, and you picked the year 1966, which is a really good year for me anyway. In 1966, the I was a, a, a fan, and uh, I would mow lawns, on, and then on Saturday I'd have enough money, I'd take the bus downtown and go see Hammer Horror movies at the Cabrillo Theater. And uh, uh, it was day in summer, 1966, I got home and looked in the paper, and there was a science fiction convention in Mission Valley at the old Stardust Hotel. So I got my dad to drive me down there. 4.30 in the afternoon, and I think I stayed down there until 1 o'clock, I called him up to pick me up. Um, but um, from my perspective, that may not have been the most successful convention as a, you know, may have lost money and whatever. That was a fantastic, that changed my life. I discovered fandom. Yeah. We and didn't actually lose money, but we didn't make it. Yeah, I met Forrest J. Good. Ackerman, the editor of Famous yeah. Monsters, and uh, had my picture test, I'll have the picture, my picture taken with him. and. Uh, uh, just a fantastic to find all of those people working in it, and as a kid to be uh, sit down and have a conversation with somebody like Frank Herbert or Paul Anderson, and and be treated as a as a reasonable sentient being, as a, more as an adult and not talked down to, it was a, that was very very heady for me. Yeah, and I became, became a, a, I became a convinced, a dedicated science fiction fan that weekend. Yeah, the, the convention, although it was kind of thin, we did have Paul Anderson and Karen Anderson there. We did have uh, uh, theater surgeon was there. We did have uh, 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 actually a number of people were there. And there's always been a science fiction presence in San Diego. The first Western Con was in 1952. Yeah. And uh, um, I can't recall uh, who wrote uh, um, uh, Logan's Run. Um, George Quaid Johnson and and William Nolan was the chairman of that Western Club in uh, 52. And uh, uh, he was just here. Yeah. yeah. And, and uh, so it's kind of worth keeping that. My science fiction as a fandom kind of died out in San Diego until um, we started up the party clubs in the early 60s. But uh, uh, the 66 convention also involved getting other people involved. Harry Harrison had moved to San Diego. And uh, Harry actually worked for EC Comics back in the 50s. Yeah. So he had some really funny stories to tell about some of the crazy stuff that went on there. He, he, he taught a science nice. fiction class at San Diego State in the yeah. late 60s. Yeah. Like Greg Bear uh, was a, a, a student there. Right. And I would drop in on the class. Yeah. And uh, Harry had parties down at his house down in uh, Imperial Beach. Right. Uh, and, which and were really were, great. A lot of crazy, lot of strange crazies. people. Yeah. So, yeah. And a lot of yeah. fun. And John, of course, John Hull, of course, oh, let's uh, talk just about around him. the corner. Yeah. Just one thing about uh, Harry, though, is that he shared a studio with Wally Wood. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. He, he was actually doing... Well, he went to school with, uh, um, oh, uh, what was the name of the guy that, that uh, sicked uh, Frank Rosetta onto the world? Um, uh, the guy who did all the Tarzan covers for Ace books and stuff uh, back in the early Roy, 60s. Roy Crinkle. Roy Crinkle, yeah. yeah. Uh, Harry Harrison and Roy Crinkle went to art school together. Oh, and uh, uh, a lot of interesting stories came out of it. Roy Crinkle was an extremely wealthy eccentric, it turns out, who used to, you know, have air-conditioned climate control for his co collection. He didn't, you know, he had the money. He, he just wanted to work in the field. Yeah. He was very slow and meticulous. And he ran out of energy for working on the covers because they wanted somebody to do this new character called Conan. So he went back to EC for a character that uh, for another artist he thought might fit, a guy named Frank Rosetta, uh, who then went on to do the Conan covers, which I think probably have gotten a few people's attention. Uh, you know, can, can we talk about the Jack? Before before we about, get to Judd Hall, yeah, Mike has not had oh. a chance to say a word. Uh, I want to know how Mike got involved in comics. 
Well, I didn't have a lot of money. We didn't have a lot of money in my family for buying comics when I was when I was really younger, and so I didn't. I could only occasionally read them. But uh, around uh, my well, probably around 66, 67, my my older brother was uh, uh, going to a bookstore downtown called Lanning's Bookstore, which is the Yaki Mansion, and they they had a lot of these uh, coverless old horror comics and such down there, and he would bring those back home, and, and they seemed pretty strange to me at the time. And, and uh, he would also bring home sometimes pulp magazines from there, and I, I would look at those. And then um, uh, a couple of the other kids in the neighborhood and myself all kind of got interested in comics in 60, uh, the summer of 67, I think, after I was out of sixth grade. And, and uh, I, I discovered, actually, I discovered Marvel Comics and Edgar Rice Burroughs at about the same time. And, and, uh, both of those were a revelation to me, and, and, and we, uh, I remember uh, there was a little, they, they were both kind of viewed as dimly my parents in those days, I think, and I remember my older sister shopping with her in, in this store, it was either Fed Mart or, or uh, White Front, you can think, of, like a Walmart type store, and and uh, they had a book uh, thing, and I had a little money left over from Christmas or something, and I, I, uh, they had a, uh, was it Pirates of Venus, I think it was, yeah. Edgar Rice Burroughs story with kind of a lurid uh, Roy Crinkle cover of a flying Venusian carrying off some scantily clad yeah. woman. And, and then every, anyway, I bought it, and, and or I put it in the shopping cart because I was going to buy it. My sister was so mortified that she actually turned the book over so nobody could see the cover as she was pushing the cart around. <laughs> so, so humiliating her brother would read something like that. 